thanks for the kind welcome by, by Marva, but by folks who met me as I came in the door and was just getting ready for worship. It's good to be with you. It has been a while. I come here fairly often, actually, to hang out with Sean Howard. We usually go for a walk or a coffee every couple weeks, um, so we switch spots. And yeah, I heard that, uh, I heard that Bert had said you were going to do a pastor swap. I think that was the, yeah, so Sean took issue with the language there. So yes, this is a pulpit exchange, and so I went back earlier just to make sure my pulpit is coming, and it's huge. Come on in, St. Giles Kingsway pulpit. I'm kidding, but if you go to our church, it is a little more traditional, as this church probably used to have a big pulpit somewhere over here, right? And our church is quite traditional. Um, so good to be here, a pulpit exchange. We don't switch the pulpits, we switch the pastors who preach from them, and it's nice to do that once in a while, just to remind um, each other in our congregations of the, the breadth of the church. It's a big church, um, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, the Christian Church throughout the world. Good to be together. So, um, I'm wondering if, uh, if someone here, I'm used to in our church, someone usually reads the gospel, and I'm wondering if someone wants to do that just to set the tone today. Do you put the reading on the screen? Is that right? Or is it, uh, it's not up there? No? It's, uh, okay, so I'm wondering if somebody would like to. The gospel reading is Mark 16. It's page 1588, so we can follow along together. And uh, maybe someone could do that. It, you could think about that as, as I talk a little bit more. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit more of the, the story. Both Sean and I moved here to Toronto in 2012. So we came to our pulpits, to our churches um, at that time and got to know each other. And we've been through a lot, right? The, the challenges in ministry um, coming through COVID. You're still standing, folks. That's something to celebrate. We've made it through uh, this season, and we have that unity, that, that belief, both of us and our congregations, that Jesus is still in the business of changing lives. And so we come to the Holy Scriptures, the Gospel text, um, eager to hear what the Lord has to say to us. Uh, Mark's Gospel is where our church has been spending time since Epiphany. So that's early in January, Epiphany through Lent, and now into Easter. And it's often been called the Coles Notes Gospel, Mark. It, he gets to the point. You'll see a word show up in Mark's Gospel a lot, and that word is immediately. Immediately Jesus did this, or immediately the disciples went here or did this. So it's brief and to the point. And so too with the Easter account in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16. Although, when if your Bible's open, um, although you can see verse 9 to 20 there, that the, the gospel account continues, um, really the original account was just verse 1 to 8. And it ends in kind of a, a strange way, um, a surprising ending. And so... I'm going to, together, we'll reflect on that as, as we read. Is there somebody who wants to read, or should I just, is that unusual to invite someone up? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Robbie's pointing in. Well, let me begin. I'm just, uh, yeah, Mark 16, that's okay. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. 
but go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pause to pray. Lord, we're thankful for the living hope, the gospel, the beautiful words of that song sung. Hallelujah. The tomb is emptied. It has no power. The lion, the lion of Judah, the promised one, the Messiah, has roared, has made known his victory over death over sin, over the grave. Hallelujah. Lord, we continue to celebrate the Easter season. Speak to us as, uh, as we reflect on this beautiful text of Mark's gospel this morning. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that last verse in the scripture uh, is not how we want the Easter account the Easter story to end. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. It's not a great ending to the Easter story. Sort of strange. We know it doesn't end there. We read in the other gospel accounts that the word does get out and Jesus does appear to the disciples. But yeah, that ending so sharp, so shocking. When those women went into the tomb and they saw the man, it says in Mark's gospel, almost all the other gospels sort of say it's an angel, you know. Uh, when they went into the tomb, they saw the man sitting there and he said, he is risen. Didn't they know the response? Christ is risen indeed. Do you folks do that on Easter Sunday, right? Let's try that again just so we don't forget. So I say, he is risen Christ is risen indeed. Didn't they know that? <laughs> no, this, this is the first Easter, right? It's good to remind ourselves, yeah, that those rhythms, those rituals, which we find simple to say, not too costly or shocking, they, they didn't yet know. They are fearful. This was the Lord's Day. They weren't yet calling it the Lord's Day, Sunday, but it was the day after the Sabbath. The Sabbath began on the Friday evening. I know you were, many of you gathered together on Good Friday and uh, remembered the passion of Christ, his, the last evening with his disciples around the table, and then his passion on the cross. Uh, it was Good Friday account, Jesus' death, and ending with his burial in the tomb. Right? That was Friday. Friday evening. The Sabbath was beginning. And so the faithful disciples of Jesus, the women in particular, would have wanted to properly anoint his body, wrap it in linen, sort of, sort of like when we think of the Egyptian mummies. Really, that's in the, in the Middle East. They would do that as well. Just wrap the body in that white linen and put him in the tomb. They weren't able to because you can't work on the Sabbath. So the women weren't able to bury him properly. So Jesus was buried quickly by men who didn't know what they were doing, probably, right? Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, very generous, gave part of his family tomb uh, and let Jesus be buried there. And a huge stone was rolled in front because the Jewish leaders were worried. They said, we need to have someone guarding this tomb because the followers of Jesus said he's the Messiah. I don't want this second deception to be worse than the first. I don't want them to come and steal his body away and say that he rose from the grave. So a huge stone was rolled in front of the tomb and and a detachment of soldiers were there. But just before we get to the Lord's Day again, there's that time, Friday evening all the way to Sunday morning. What was that like for Jesus' disciples? When I say disciples, I don't just mean the 12 apostles, or at this point, the 11 apostles, Judas, 
killed himself after his betrayal. Um, the 11 apostles, but also the, the crowd of faithful followers of Jesus. What was Sabbath celebration like for them? My goodness. They didn't go into Jerusalem. They didn't want to be linked to Jesus. They thought they might die. So they probably stayed in Bethany. They might not have even gone into the little synagogue in Bethany, just a suburb of Jerusalem. They probably were fearful in their home, worshiping God. It was the Passover Seder, and the, the Scripture passages read were a reminder of God's deliverance, that Moses was appointed by God to lead the people of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the promised land. And, and so always on the Passover Seder, the Passover celebration, the Jews would remember God's deliverance, but not only remember, but anticipate the fuller deliverance of God. That one who would be like Moses, a great leader, to set the people of Israel free, but, but set them free, not just from Rome, not just kind of oppressors physically, but spiritually give them eternal life with God. Bring them into the kingdom of God. The Passover celebration was remembering, but also looking forward to the one who would come. The disciples thought Jesus was that one. How hard was Friday evening, Saturday, for his disciples? Reading those texts, reading the prophecies of a Messiah who come, did, did they already start saying to themselves, well, I guess it wasn't him. So we look for another one. I think we like to think they were very faithful and eager and waiting. And Jesus had said a couple times, like, I will rise again. But we often read in the gospel accounts that it's like the disciples just couldn't comprehend it. It seemed like nonsense when Jesus said these words. They, they didn't believe it. When he died and he was buried, that was pretty final for the disciples. How hard was that Sabbath day for them? But early on the first day of the week, even though I think the women didn't have a resurrection hope in them, they, they went, they wanted to treat Jesus, their master, their rabbi, respectfully, and they hadn't been able to properly anoint his body and wrap him, and so they went to the tomb. They wanted to, to treat him with respect, give him a proper burial. But as these three women walked there, they were talking about, well, how can we possibly move the stone away? It's massive. I don't know if the guards are there. Maybe they'll move it for us when we explain why. But that was their greatest concern. But interesting, what was the hope in the women's chest as they walked to, to the burial site? What was their hope. Their hope was they might get to his dead body to properly anoint him. That's as high as their hopes went, to get to Jesus' dead body. What are your hopes this Orthodox Easter Sunday? Uh, the season of Easter continues all the way to May 28th. Uh, May 28th is Pentecost Sunday. I think something fantastic is happening on Pentecost Sunday. I think there might be, I've heard rumors, a baptism in this place. That's beautiful. The Holy Spirit falls down. So this is the season of Easter. What are our hopes as Easter people, as resurrection people? The women came to the tomb, the stone was rolled away, their hopes were fulfilled. They can get to Jesus' dead body. But when they go in the tomb, there's this man in glowing white clothes, an angel who's there. And he says, you're looking for Jesus, I know who you're looking for, he's not here, he is risen. And they don't say, Christ is risen indeed, they aren't ready yet for that, right? They're, they're shocked, they're bewildered. A greater problem has been solved for the women than they expected. A greater hope 
has been offered an infinitely greater change, eternally more significant event has taken place. And it's like they just weren't ready to receive that. The one your hope was in, this one has risen from the dead. He has gone ahead to Galilee, go tell his disciples, and I guess Peter also, he mentions, right? Peter's in that separate category there whether out of respect or because Peter has denied him so much, just assure him, he's come for you as well. He's risen for you as well. Go to Galilee as he told you. Their hope has changed, right? Their little hopes. What are our hopes as Christian people? Are they little hopes? The women's hopes have changed. Not, I just want to get to the dead body and do a proper respectful burial, burial to is he alive? Has this happened? Has that nonsensical phrase he was saying that he would raise from the dead, is it actually going to happen? Did it happen today? The Gospel of Mark reminds us of the shock of the event more than the other Gospels. Sort of leaves it bare. Surprising. Shocking. Maybe when you celebrated communion on Good Friday, I think you had communion, maybe you say the Apostles' Creed, and there's phrases in there that become almost ritualistic. We just say them again and again. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and goes on, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Yawn, go on to the next line. He then ascended to heaven. Like It becomes very ritual, right? rose from the dead on the third day, glorious day, glorious power of God at work. It's, it's alarming. We say it, it's rhythmic, it's just what we say, but to remember the shockingness of that first Resurrection Sunday. I came from uh, British Columbia before I came here to Toronto 10 years ago, and I was in a city called New Westminster. It's not too far from uh, Vancouver. It's all kind of packed in, very dense population area along the Fraser River. And I was given the opportunity one time while I was there uh, to do a burial at sea. Has anybody been part of a burial at sea? They probably don't do it on Lake Ontario, right? It's probably not legal, right? In British Columbia, they are very careful about what you put into the ocean waters, but if you're a certain distance from shore in the ocean and it's in the proper container, it was this man's ashes in an urn that you put in the water and then it's, it's made so that it just sinks very slowly. So you can say your regular words, dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. And so you can say those regular words as you place the urn into the ocean waters. So, yeah, when I was uh, invited to be present at this burial at sea, it was uh, an interesting experience. The man loved the ocean. He was a he was a man who enjoyed fishing, so his family brought me out on their fishing boat. We had a really nice day. He was very elderly, I think maybe 90 or so, so it wasn't really a time of grieving. It was a time of giving thanks. But imagine with me, this didn't happen, imagine with me, as I'm saying those familiar words and praying for Bob as we commit his remains to the deep, and we're standing there. Imagine as we're standing there watching the urn slowly sink beneath the waves. Imagine a, a ghost-like apparition rises and, you know, and then speaks to us and says, Behold, you have buried Bob, but in fact he is not dead. He is alive. He is back on shore. When you return, then you will see him. <laughs> like, how would we feel on the boat? Would the family be like, that's wonderful. No, they would be alarmed and shocked and greatly distressed. They don't want him coming back alive, right? It, he suffered much, a very aged man. Probably his elderly sister would fall over and I'd have a second burial at sea to do while I was out there, right? It, it's shocking. 
the world is turned upside down. And I, sh I share that just as a thought of like, wow, yeah, yeah. When the angel says he is risen, we wouldn't just say, yes, Christ is risen indeed. I knew with confidence this would happen. I knew, I knew. No, no, it's shocking, shocking. The women were filled with terror. It's almost like they'd prefer the dead body to be there. The world would make sense. I'm not critiquing them. That's just what they came expecting. We can't become numb to the mystery. I think Mark's gospel is helpful in that, just to remember the, the rawness and the shock. It seems unbelievable, but we know it's true. He rose from the dead. Yes, the Bible tells me so. That's why it's true. But more lives are changed. As people put their faith in Jesus Christ 2,000 years later, a mystery takes place. Something happens. There's this warmth. There's this sense of, I now know God through faith in Christ. I now have peace. I now have a living hope. In God. Resurrection power is released. Whether we expect it or not, this happens. In this church, St. Andrews Islington, there's been many stories and testimonies over the decades of its existence of people who have met Jesus Christ and it's changed their lives and they cannot do anything but believe. Yes, this is real. It's not just ritual. It's not just tradition. I've met Jesus. My life has been changed. Mark didn't need to say more in his gospel. That verse 9 to 20, that was added later by other editors, and that's, that's fine. Mark didn't need to say more. He was the earliest of the gospel writers. It was enough just to tell fellow Christians, and then he rose from the dead. And you know it, because you felt it. You live it. You live his resurrection power in you. What are your hopes this Easter 2 Sunday that this year the Leafs might do it? Is that as big as your hopes get? That the Jays are really doing well this year? Is, is that as big as our hopes get? That our dental appointment next time won't be as painful? Is that the biggest hopes we have? You'll get a raise maybe this year at work. They'll bump it up by a dollar an hour. Are we coming before God with little hopes, expecting little things? Or do we come with big hopes, knowing the history of Jesus' resurrection power and his impact? in countless lives before. And if we think back, it's not always fresh, but even times when we had given up, and it's like, forget this. Why? Why do I faithfully come to worship when nothing's happening? The relationship in my family is still broken. I, I still can't get ahead in life. Why do I do this? And then Jesus meets you there and says, I am with you. I love you. You are mine. I have called you. Remember that. And have hope that Jesus will meet you again. Even if you're fearful. Even if you're confused. Even if you're bewildered and not expecting Jesus' power to break out. Jesus will meet you where you are. Can we hope bigger? That it's not just the tomb is empty and we don't know where the body is, but the tomb is empty. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God is at work. God's power is still at work. We feel the joy and peace. It's a mystery. We want to be able to make this story make a little more sense sometimes to our friends and family who don't believe and try to make it more enticing or logical. We can't. It's, it's a mystery. It's a miracle. And we just pray that one day they will meet Christ. 
that they will experience the love of Jesus. Let us be a people of big hope. Believing God is still in the business of changing lives, transforming lives. Friends, we are a resurrection people. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Loving God, we do rejoice in the shocking mystery of the gospel account. Sometimes we can just sit back and, and laugh. We, we don't get it. We can't explain it. But when we speak of you, Jesus, when we lift you up, when we put our trust in you, there is, are moments of peace and joy and hope that don't match our circumstances we're in. I pray that we might have big hopes, that we might know you more intimately, that we might then reflect the hope, peace, love, and joy to the world outside. This is our prayer, we pray, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Sisters, brothers in Christ, may we go forth from this place of resurrection people, a people filled with hope. May the grace of Jesus Christ be with you. The love of God surround you. The Holy Spirit guide you this day and forevermore. Amen. Now for some of the announcements in the life and work of St. Days. The food bank. Our cupboard is getting bare. We are very thankful that a lot of people have responded to our call for reusable bags. We got a ton of those, so thank you so much. Now we need a few tins of stuff. Whatever you have to spare when you're shopping, just buy an extra. That's all. We're not asking you to bring lots and lots. Just bring one extra one. And if we all bring one extra one, it will certainly fill up our cupboards. The um, need is great, and we have had quite an increase in the number of our community members who need our help. So you can drop them off when you come for the service, or you can come on Thursdays from noon to one and just drop off whatever you have. Everything is welcome. On April 30th, we are having what is called, this is getting involved opportunity. You know, I, I thought that was such a kind of formal, um, really serious thing. But what we really are saying is that we need your participation. We need you to do something. We have a list of things that um, we need doing, and we ask for your help. Don't think this is something that you're going to have to give 100 hours per whatever. Some are as little as one hour per month. So don't tell me I'm old, I can't do it. Look, people. <laughs> I am what they call, I'm blossoming. <laughs> and when you're blossoming, usually it's because you're going to bear fruit. So what does that tell you? <laughs> when you blossom, you have to bear fruit. And working for God is one of those bearing fruit things. So keep that in mind if you're going to come and tell me that, you know, you're, getting, you're too old, you don't have the time. It won't work with me. <laughs> Just saying. So come on April 30th to this getting involved. And as a little carrot that we're dangling, there will be coffee and snacks. That means you can come up and chat and you know, talk with people you haven't had a chance to talk with. And at the same time, give a little help wherever it's needed. You'll see the list. You can talk to people about it and see what's going on. And now that I've bend your ears. I hope you listen. See you next time. We will be...